Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Practical Bible with Ron, where I talk about using the Bible in our everyday life. So I want to continue on with what I talked about last weekend, that I do believe that the charismatic movement needs a reformation. We need to have our feet firmly planted in the Word of God. So I want to continue on and show some clips about Amy Simple McPherson, where here she was a flawed person, but within seven years, she had over 40 million people attend her church. She had all these healings and all these people brought to the, to the Lord and all these things happening in her life. And then follow up with, you know, Smith Wigglesworth about some of the good things he did and then follow up with, you know, why I think we should have this reformation for the charismatic movement. So let me first read these scriptures here and then I'm going to play my video that I did last, last week because the last part of that video was so important. And I believe it's so important nowadays to have our feet firmly planted in the Word of God. And we need that as long as well as we need prayer, we need fasting, we need all these things. We can't just have one part of it. We need to go the whole mile, the full mile. So let me read this scripture here. And then I'm going to click over to the video that I played, the last part of the video that I had last week. It says, Therefore be patient, brother, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. This is in James 5, 8. So you read here, a farmer is someone who he produces stuff. And as Christians, we should be producing stuff. And we need to have our hearts in the right place. You know, it says, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And I know this was written almost 2,000 years ago, but this is so true in today's world. So we do need some sort of reformation. We do need some sort of change within the charismatic church. We do need to put it all together. We can't just take one little piece of it and say, oh, I want to prophesy. I want to do this. I want to do miracles and not have the other pieces in place. That's so important. We need to put it all together. We need to be a well-rounded Christian in our faith, in our belief, in our habits, in our holiness, in our standards, and still do it all with gentleness and love for one another. So with that being said, let me carry this over to the last part of the video that I did last week. God bless you all. Thanks. With God and having their, you know, having their foot firmly planted in the Word of God, and God is moving in these places. My church, I love my pastor. And we had 156 people saved last year. 40-something people, I think, baptized. Something like that, 42 or 52, something like that. So things are happening. But there has to be that firm foundation. So here's another example of someone who was, you know, one of the early, you know, charismatic people. Amy Simple McPherson. She started the Four Square Church. She started a church in Los Angeles, one of the first mega churches to exist with over 5,000 people. They received 40 million visitors in the first seven years. They shared the word of God out to 40, even nowadays on YouTube, to share something out with the today's technology. And you're looking at this is back in the 19, I'm thinking, 30s, you know, during the Great Depression. So, yeah, 1930s, 1940s. And able to share, have visitors of 40 million people. And I, like I said, with YouTube, to have 40 million views is like, you know, you're a, you, that's something big with today's technology. Imagine how much bigger that was back in those days. 40 million visitors. <laughs> that just amazes me. You know, she developed a church organization to provide both physical and spiritual needs. She helped convince doctors and dentists to provide free clinics for people People couldn't pay their electric. She helped them out because this is during the Great Depression. She had soup kitchens. She did relief efforts, like when they had the big earthquake there, and did all kinds of things with the community. Because her thing was don't only just feed them, you know, their Holy Spirit, but feed their physical selves as well. She was a, a faith healer or someone who, I don't like to use the word faith healer. She was someone who prayed um, and who had faith and seen a lot of people healed. She would have monthly, you know, prayer things with people, praying for the sick, weekly prayer things for the sick. She had a radio show that shared the gospel. The thing is, that, you know, here she is. She had all these amazing things that God was doing with her. I mean, you know, the, some of the stuff I've read, she'd had 5,000 people at church, but she would have people turned away. People just lined outside and just turned away saying, 
we're, we're full of capacity. We, you, you know, so you had to get there early in order to get to her church and listen to what was being preached. So even though all these things were happening in her life, she was married and divorced three times. There was a kidnapping scandal where she ran off with the radio guy that was doing her show. <laughs> And then came back and kind of said, oh, it's just, I was kidnapped. And a lot of controversy there. <laughs> so here she was, this, this, this person that, and I think is we're all humans and we all make mistakes. But there's something I feel like there has to be a change where we start digging back into the Word of God and union, make a, a marriage or a union between the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Another guy I want to talk about here, Jack Cole. He had one of the largest tent revivals other than Oral Roberts. He was nicknamed the man of reckless faith. He actually went to Oral Roberts <laughs> tent revival, measured how big the tent was, and, and ordered one that was bigger than his, the Oral Roberts tent. <laughs> um, in 1956, he had a magazine that had over 250,000 circulations. He opened up a children's orphanage. Uh, his big controversy was that you know, he believed that you shouldn't, you know, take medicines or visit doctors. And then we looked at today's modern day of people who, you know, that in the charismatic movement, we have your Jimmy Swaggers, your Todd Bentley from the Lakeland Revival in 2008, and more recently, your Mike Bickle. So people look at this and they like, you know, we got to get away from that stereotype that people have about the charismatic move or, or the Christians, you know, people say, well, how about the guy he's doing whatever. So I should be able to do whatever I want. That's not the case. That's not how we should view this. You know, we should live a godly life. And so one of the people I want to, at least I talked about all these people who had, who were human, who made mistakes. And it seems to be, you know, have this negative kind of vibe sometimes of the charismatic movement or with the, 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 and the sensationists use this quite a bit, you know, and it, it's sad, you know, they try to take this weakness of man, which we are weak and we make mistakes and they're using that and claiming, oh, well, if that was really a move of God, then they wouldn't be doing this. That's not the case. Look at David. David made all kinds of mistakes. <laughs> he made a lot of mistakes. And look where he is. Look at Paul. Paul says, you know, I was the worst of all of them, you know. So we can't use that, but that the devil will try to use that, or the adversary will try to use that against the church, and we got to overlook that. So there's so since I talked about, let me talk about a guy named Smith Wigglesworth, who was really a true true general amongst the charismatic. There's not a lot of people who will say bad things about him. He's like one of these people who's been a pillar and withstood the the, the words of time. Um, the trials of time, and people look back and say, that was a, truly a, a, a man of God. And he was a charismatic, you know. So it was very positive things. You know, he raised many of the pe- many people from the dead. He was a man of faith who prayed for the sick. He seen many healed. He once stated that, I'll only pray for you once to pray twice is unbelief. And, you know, he's, he was one of those guys, those foundations, one of those generals that you could look at in the charismatic movement. So here's my take on this. I do believe there needs to be this reformation within the charismatic church because a lot of these people we hear on on TV or on, on the internet, I mean, there's just so much stuff going on there. And they, they step outside the word of God. And don't get me wrong, some of these things that people are doing is really good, like the deliverance ministry. I think that's really good. But also needs to be a little bit of shaking in there with the word of God put in there too to raise disciples. You know, we can't blame the devil for everything. The Bible says that lust is the lust of the flesh. You know, you can't say, well, the reason I have lust is because of the devil. No, that's you. You gotta look at yourself. You need to ask for forgiveness and say, God, keep me from doing this stuff. Help me, Lord. You know, we can't blame the devil for everything. There's some things that we as humans we do that, you know, we can't just we can't say, well, the devil made me do it. And then we write off, and then we keep doing it. Oh, the devil just keeps making me do it. No, there has to be change in our life. And that's where we take the Word of God and we union that with the Holy Spirit. And not just, you know, and like I said, I'm not against deliverance at all. I think deliverance is a really good thing. 
I just think there should be some extra discipleship that goes with it and some extra stuff that goes with it. Because there's a lot of people who's been delivered. And I listen to some of these deliverance guys, and they have some really good things to say. You know, I really, I think God is moving. But I think that's a step. And what's that next step going to be? You know, that next step is going to be, okay, now it's time to get the Word of God in here and start discipling these people, you know, and, and, and letting these people understand that you can't just blame the devil for everything. There's some things that need to change in our life whether it's pride, which my pastor preached on pride today, which was awesome, you know, or, or whatever may be going on in your life, you know, pride or sin or addiction, what's happening here. And there just needs to be that to happen. You know, we all need to believe that God is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and that God's grace is still saving people and healing people. So for my sensationist people out there, God's not changed. He's still saving people. He's still healing people. He's still moving in people's lives. Um, we need that sound biblical foundation. We need to stop, stop with the prosperity doctrine, gospel. And we need to stop with this stuff that it's okay to do whatever I want and then feel like we're still going to make it to heaven because that's a lie. We have to live a life that corresponds to what the Word of God tells us to do. I'm not going to say we're not going to mess up. And that's where that sanctification process comes. And I talk about this a lot because we have to really be very, very strong in our beliefs and in, in what God has told us through the Word of God. I just can't, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, I've seen so many people that had the Spirit of God where they just, they could pray and people be healed, but then there's these other things where they just kind of like put, put themselves on a pedestal and they put themselves above the Word of God. They put themselves above God. We can't do that. We need to stay humble before God. And if we mess up, like for instance, you know, the Mike Bickle thing is like a really, you know, thing that people are talking about. You know, instead of Mike, you know, in 2020s, you know, different. You know, we can look back, you know, 2020s, you know, we can look back, you know, yeah, if I did, I wish I'd have done this different. But really, if you'd gone to the Word of God and done what David had done, when David with Bathsheba had messed up, what did he do? He was repentant for it. He didn't try to hide it. Get all these men of God out there hiding all this stuff. Come forward. Even as a, as a Christian, come forward and stop doing what you were doing. The thing about David, and I heard this priest was, when he would sin, he wouldn't go back to that same sin again. You know, the Bible talks about as a, you know, we shouldn't go back to our sin as a dog returns back to its vomit. You know, that's how we should be as Christians. We should strive to be what God wants us to be. And I've only got the one scripture at the very first. That, that's, that's unusual for me. But this was something that God just laid on me so strong. It's like I couldn't break it. I couldn't break free from what God had laid on my heart. We have to be firm in the Word of God. We have to be firm in knowing who Christ is. We need to know that He has so much grace, so much love that He's going to save us. So much grace and so much love that He's going to heal us, that He's going to want good things for us. You know, I'm not saying, well, you know, that God doesn't want good things for us. He does. But we got to stop following. Like the prosperity of gospel is more about you and not about God. You know, and sinning and saying, hey, it's okay for me to sin and do whatever I want. No, we can't do that as Christians. We have to be repentant when we do stuff. We have to say, God, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. And there's so many things that God wants to do, but we, we're not putting that foundation back into the Word of God. You know, if anything... I want people to say that they were able to see Christ in me. Not me, but the God, Christ that lives inside of me, that Holy Spirit that lives inside of me. You know, because it's all about glorifying God. That's what it's all about, glorifying God. And I think revival will happen once we get that together. Once we get it and we merge the two, stop trying to build this agenda of look at me, look at what I'm doing, instead of saying, look at what God is doing. 
You know, I have to, I have to hand it over to uh, Evan Roberts. The man was so humble, and he just he was so afraid that people were showing him so much attention that God wasn't giving the glory, and he stopped his ministry. We don't want to do that either. We want to keep pushing forward. We want to stand boldly for the word of God. And we got to do it with love, with gentleness in our hearts. I just, I could talk about this all day long. But just, I just, I pray that God will open our eyes. Because I really do believe that in order for true revival to happen, that revival is going to reach those two billion people, that there has to be that union of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. So I don't think R.T. Kendall was too far off from that. And I may do some more messages on this. I'm more of a preaching today, teaching, preaching type thing today. (laughs) And I know I'm doing a lot of topical stuff. But I think it's very, and I don't like doing topical stuff. I'm more of an expository kind of person. I really enjoy expository. But I'm really bringing out that as Christians, as charismatics, wherever you call yourself, that we have to be aligned with the Word of God. We have to obey the Holy Spirit. And when it's laid on our hearts, Holy Spirit lays something on our hearts to do something, we need to do it. And we need to do it expediently. We need to do it, you know, the Holy Spirit lays on our heart, do it. You know, that helps us. Helps us grow in Christ. So I love you all. And with that being said, it's just bless you. Peace.